Thank you, Stephanie, for this wonderful introduction. Uh, so, uh, as most of you know, uh, I've given a lot of talks here and everywhere else, primarily related to endovascular treatment of aneurysmal disease, abdominal aortic aneurysm, thoracic aneurysm, and so on, carotid disease, but uh, I have never given a presentation uh, here uh, to this audience uh, related to uh, this particular topic, which is chronic venous insufficiency. And I call this the forgotten part of circulation because um, as uh, you fellows know, very little is um, done as far as education is concerned at our institution and at many cardiology uh, fellowship programs related to this particular problem. Those uh, few of you that were lucky enough to uh, rotate with us, uh, Leachman Cardiology Associate, had an opportunity to see plenty of patients with this condition, and also uh, a variety of treatment modalities that are available, uh, including uh, the latest technology that we have. So uh, I have really nothing pertinent to disclose, uh, no connections with any companies uh, that are related to this uh, particular field, other than my personal bias that uh, those patients are neglected and need to be treated. So as all of you know, uh, venous pump, as far as the lower extremities are concerned, uh, is uh, uh, related to muscle contraction in your lower extremities. So it's a passive type of a pump. And inspiration also helps in moving the blood flow from the lower extremities of, upward towards uh, your heart. So inactivity, uh, makes this uh, pump uh, uh, inefficient and all of us that are performing interventional procedures, interventional cardiologists and uh, also uh, surgeons uh, are at risk of um, having this pump malfunction because we stand for a long period of time and do not necessarily contract our muscles uh, on a regular basis and uh, therefore we are also prime candidates for chronic venous insufficiency syndrome. So here you can see a normal vein where the valves open and valves close, and that should be standard. However, when you have a dilated veins due to a variety of reasons, and some of it's just inactivity, and the other ones are from pressures uh, compressing the veins above, you will, give, uh, you will get uh, dilatation of the veins, and you will have a lack of uh, uh, closure of the valve, so you'll have actually retrograde flow uh, or stasis that uh, stays uh, in the lower extremities. So obviously this condition is caused by failed venous uh, valves. Uh, now venous reflux um, in the saphenous vein is most uh, common underlying uh, cause of painful uh, varicose veins in the lower extremities. There are other conditions, but uh, reflux is the major cause. Uh, hypertension uh, can be three times above normal at the ankle level while we are standing in a cath lab. So um, I don't know how many of you, and doesn't matter what age you are, uh, very frequently at the end of the day, you feel a little bit of burning, tingling sensation, and maybe some degree of uh, numbness in the lower extremities. And that is related to venous stasis and lack of circulation of the venous blood the venous blood is very acidy from metabolites. A lot of lactic acid is in there, and that lactic acid uh, causes all of those uh, symptoms. Um, so it's a serious condition, and it's almost invariably a progressive disease. If you follow patients over a longer period of time, you will see that this disease progresses. Now, how big and how prevalent is chronic venous insufficiency disease? Uh, I'm absolutely positive that a lot of you will be astonished by the numbers that I will show you. It is estimated that somewhere between 30 to 40 million in the United States suffer from symptoms of chronic venous insufficiency. However, only 1.7 million roughly uh, seek treatment on an annual basis. So we have somewhere close to 30 or 28 million that um, do not receive uh, treatment. No. And uh, so, uh, so they basically remain untreated uh, 
and suffer with symptoms. As you can see here, it can manifest itself just with varicose veins, like in this particular case, which is a relatively mild type of a finding to a more advanced non-healing wounds in the lower extremity with uh, infection. So it affects all age groups, and I'm looking at you fellows. You, don't, you are not uh, exempt from this at all. Now, another very important fact that uh, I'm sure a lot of you are not aware of that chronic venous insufficiency is twice as common as the incidence of coronary artery disease, okay? And 10 times more common than uh, prevalence of peripheral arterial disease in the lower extremities. So, about pathophysiology of this condition uh, <clears throat> related to venous hypertension, uh, you get leukocyte trapping, that do harm to those valves and the venous wall. You get release of proteolytic enzymes, destruction of cellular membrane, uh, leakage of the plasma proteins, um, and leakage eventually of the red blood cells and destruction of tissue. You get hemosiderin and hyperpigmentation, as you can see here. And then you get tissue hypoxia, dermatitis uh, and uh, lipodermatosclerosis, and eventually ulcer formation, infection, and bleeding. So this is what I would call the most advanced stage that we can see. So uh, chronic venous insufficiency facts that a lot of us are not aware of is the most underdiagnosed condition to the best of my knowledge. It is the most ignored condition and most misdiagnosed condition. What I mean by that is that some other condition is blamed for this, whether it's peripheral arterial disease or diabetes or whatever else. Uh, there are many other conditions you will see in differential diagnosis that can mimic this condition. It's the, also the most undertreated medical condition that I know. The question is why? Why is this happening? Well, there is a misconception that this is just a cosmetic disorder, particularly in early stages when you see varicose veins and or a little bit of leg edema. Uh, there is so little awareness uh, among population in general and also among uh, healthcare providers of various specialties. And a lot of providers are unaware that in right hands with appropriate treatment the resolution of this condition is very rewarding for our patients. And there is also a general failure to realize a link that exists between venous insufficiency and lower extremity swelling or edema, nocturnal leg cramps, restless leg syndrome, and venous ulceration. There is also a failure to consider the symptoms burden and the tremendous suffering that those uh, patients um, experience. And uh, this is not to blame only us, but also to patients as well. And very frequently you will hear from patients, well, I think it's probably related to my old age, or it's probably related to my arthritis, or it's probably related to my obesity and a variety of other things and symptoms and diagnosis, but also the providers have the same misconception where they contribute to this condition due to some other conditions or are not able to differentiate between other conditions and this particular condition. A lot of people that restless leg syndrome is something related to a neurosis, anxiety or whatever. No, it's basically subconscious way of treating this condition by contracting muscles and pumping the blood upward. So, and this is one of the most common early stages of presentation of this condition. Hence, venous disease remains a major cause of preventable morbidity and mortality. I call it for that particular reason, the forgotten side of circulation. So look at variety of things that can manifest itself as chronic venous insufficiency. Very frequently it is aching or leg or foot cramping. I have frequently encountered experience with my patients where you'll ask them a question, do you have leg cramps? And they will say no. 
It's the same thing if you ask your patient, do you have angina? And they don't know what angina means, they'll say no. Do you have chest tightness or pressure? They'll say yes. So ask all the pertinent questions that can explain patient's condition. So they'll say, no, I don't have leg cramping, but I have foot cramping, okay? Sometimes they just experience heaviness at the end of the day, pain, burning sensation, itching, tingling, swelling, numbness, restless legs. Now about numbness, a lot of patients are misdiagnosed to have a, a peripheral neuropathy. And actually they don't have a peripheral neuropathy. They have numbness related to chronic venous insufficiency. And uh, if you treat chronic venous insufficiency, in a lot of instances, you can relieve the symptom of numbness and many other symptoms as well. Once you are more advanced as far as chronic venous insufficiency is concerned, you get ulcers, you get thrombosis, bleeding, cellulitis, and infected wounds. So, uh, so pay attention to that because it's not infrequent that the patient will present to you with both conditions, peripheral arterial disease of the lower extremities, particularly in diabetics, and also chronic venous insufficiency. And you have to be able to differentiate which one is causing the primary problems, because sometimes arterial interventions are riskier and more complicated, uh, while the venous interventions might be more rewarding for certain subsets of patients that present with this problem. So it is important, therefore, to remember that varicose veins is more than simple or cosmetic problem. And you can see there are a variety of categories in the CEOAP, uh, categories that will delineate uh, how advanced this condition is. C6 is the most advanced condition. This will be C6, okay? You never want to get to this stage and then start treatment because this is only a palliative phase. You have to treat them very early in this stage or this stage, and then you have cure and uh, excellent results and very rewarding results for your patient. So what's important now, this is one of the main messages for you guys that are in fellowship program training, that nearly 80% of non-healing leg wounds are related to chronic venous insufficiency, not to peripheral arterial disease, okay? What are the risk factors for varicose veins and chronic venous insufficiency? There are many of them, and I listed some of them. It's impossible to list all of them, but the most important ones, are, as we get older, we all will get certain degree of chronic venous insufficiency and regurgitant incompetent venous valves. Family history is a very strong factor, strong indicator, and that could be due to a variety of reasons, whether it's obesity, whether it's uh, uh, lifestyle or inactivity, whether it's incidence of May-Turner syndrome, that's familial, and so on. If you have a prior history of DVT, almost invariably you will get a certain degree of valve deformity or destruction, and you will develop a certain degree of uh, valve insufficiency. History of phlebitis is very important. Ask your patients about it. Previous trauma of whatever kind that patient uh, suffered from, you can uh, also anticipate there will be a certain degree of venous insufficiency. May Turner syndrome. Now, why we call it May Turner? There were two individuals. One was May, the other one was Turner. They described it. We'll talk a little bit more about it in, in detail, okay? And then, uh, uh, you know, obesity, standing occupation, we mentioned that. Inactivity, sedentary occupation, those uh, secretaries that uh, don't get up for eight hours a day they are certainly at risk. And that's why they have restless leg syndrome because they're smart. They know what helps them to uh, relieve the discomfort. Pregnancy, of course, women primarily, right? Nowadays. Um, and uh, for that particular reason, female gender, and I have nothing against female gender, but because of all of those conditions, pregnancy, um, uh, birth control pills, um, uh, certain certain degree in activity, uh, weight gain at all the age, all of those things will contribute to that, and also May Turner syndrome as well. There are several other possible risk factors that are probably less likely to be connected with it, but um, anyhow, they certainly should be considered. 
when would additional diagnostic evaluation be of importance as far as differential diagnosis is concerned? Low back pain, sciatica. I had a lot of patients that were referred to me uh, because they underwent back surgery and the symptoms didn't improve. And the reason for it is because the primary problem was chronic venous insufficiency and not any lumbosacral spine disc disease. Degenerative joint pain, a lot of patients will have problems with arthritis, hip joint, and they think it's causing all of those symptoms, which is impossible related to that. And actually it's chronic venous insufficiency. Fibromyalgia is difficult because those patients have all kinds of complaints. Vasculitis, also another factor. Uh, arterial ischemia, peripheral arterial disease, we talked a little bit about it. Lymphedema is a problem because uh, a lot of patients with lymph lymphedema will have exactly the same symptoms as swelling. So you have to be able to differentiate those things. But that doesn't mean that you should not treat chronic venous insufficiency in patients that have lymphedema. You will be able to improve their symptoms that are related to chronic venous insufficiency. And then you'll have to address another problem, which is lymphedema. So a significant number of those will improve. Peripheral arterial disease and arthritis of various kinds. Neuropathy, okay? Uh, I mentioned peripheral neuropathy. And interestingly enough, a lot of those patients will improve. So you have to, uh, you have to make sure that you're treating proper condition. Heart failure, congestive heart failure will give you leg edema and some of those symptoms. Liver failure, hypertension, obesity, particularly morbid obesity, surgical trauma, and uh, previous injuries. All of those things play a significant role. Now let's talk a little bit about anatomy because we have to know the anatomy to be able to diagnose and to be able to treat this condition appropriately. So there are three venous systems. There is a deep venous system, there is a superficial venous system, and there are perforators connect those two. When I talk to my patients, I try to explain to them in a layman terminology because it's difficult for them to explain in any other way why are we doing certain things and what will happen? A lot of patients will worry, well, doctor, if you close that vein, what will happen? I'm not gonna have a good blood flow and so on. Then you have to explain to them, as long as your deep venous system is working well, there shouldn't be any problem by closing or removing the superficial venous system. I explained to them, this is like a backup mechanism. I tell them, if you are a skydiver, MC knows that well, and uh, you have a parachute and you have a pa spare parachute. Spare parachute has a lot of holes. You're not gonna use a spare parachute. You're gonna use your main parachute. And so the superficial venous system that's inefficient or regurgitant is like a spare parachute. Or I tell them, you have a four lane highway, you have a feeder road. Feeder road is full of potholes. Forget about a feeder road. Just stay on a four lane highway. And then they understand this concept really well. And I tell them the surgeons use those superficial veins for bypass surgery in thousands and hundreds and thousands of patients and nothing bad happens. So you have to explain to them because otherwise they become very skeptical. So superficial venous system is basically you have a greater saphenous vein which is on the inner aspect of your leg and then you have a lesser saphenous vein or a smaller saphenous vein that's position posteriorly from the knee down to your ankle. And then you have uh, communicating veins between those two systems, and you have a lateral system. Of course, you have uh, perforators that also connect the deep and superficial system. A little bit about deep veins, other than what I already mentioned, is that deep veins usually do not cause ulcerations in the lower extremities, okay? It's primarily due to superficial venous system problem and the perforators. So deep venous reflux will very frequently disappear after you treat the superficial venous system. Why is that? Because you decrease the flow that returns through the deep venous system. So, so therefore, do not worry about deep venous system, even though it might be incompetent in a certain degree. And a lot of those patients will actually improve and the, the in, incompetence of the valves in the deep system will disappear after you treat the deep venous system. Evaluation, that's extremely important. So how do you do it? There are many different 
techniques that you could use. A lot of times the best is in standing position. You have to use some augmentation maneuvers like at the saphenofemoral junction Valsalva to see if that incompetence is occurring there. That is a must. A lot of insurance companies will not approve the procedure of any kind that you intend to do unless you have incompetence of the principal saphenofemoral junction vein. And uh, so pay attention to that. Now, so what is a reflux of significance and what is a reflux of no significance? We should have less than 0.5 seconds of a reflux. That would be physiologic type of a reflux. But in a, in a uh, common femoral vein, it's uh, more than one second, okay? So pay attention to that. Now, perforators is more than half a second. So, uh, so those are the things, the numbers that you have to remember because the insurance companies will require this information from you. This is something that absolutely is astonishing to all of us that are involved in this field. If you send your patients to any of the labs, vascular labs, including this, our lab here, 94% of vein disease will be missed by standard ultrasound. If you order just a venous ultrasound study, you will not get any information related to valvular incompetence, particularly related to greater saphenous, lesser saphenous vein, or perforators. And I don't know how many of you uh, that are practicing here have sent your patients to the peripheral vascular lab here, and you, you'll get a report. This is a report that I get on a routine basis. Uh, no evidence of thrombophobitis, no evidence of DVT, um, minimal or no valvular incompetence of the deep venous system, and that's it, nothing else. So how do you know what's happening with the superficial venous system? You have to do it in a lab that is trained, technologies that are trained in doing that. 94% of labs are not trained to do that. So this is what you get in a regular lab, those two things but you don't get nothing about greater saphenous vein reflux, lesser saphenous vein reflux, accessory vein reflux, or perforated vein reflux, nothing, okay? <laughs> Embarrassing. Now, treatment options, there are a variety of treatment options available. There are conservative methods that you could use, and it's almost mandated by insurance companies. They will not allow you to do any other aggressive mode of treatment until you try conservative therapy, which is compression stockings, leg elevation while you're sitting at your desk, exercise, weight reduction, very important, and analgesic as needed. So this is something that you need to document to be able to get approval from the insurance companies. Typically, they will require three months of treatment. Now, none of those things work on a long-term basis. They work if you achieve certain goals. For instance, compression stockings work only while you wear them, but you will not correct the problem. And in a lot of instances, this is a, an absolute nuisance, particularly uh, for those high heeled persons and uh, fashion type of uh, situations where you wanna show off your beautiful legs. And uh, also because of the climate that we live in here. It's uncomfortable. So uh, most of the patients will have a difficult time in tolerating compression stockings on a long-term basis. Okay, surgical interventions that have been well tested in the past is primarily vein stripping, which is nowadays rarely used because we have other modalities that are more rewarding and less uh, traumatic and less aggressive. And those are the endovascular interventions there is a thermal to mesent ablation. I'll mention about that. It's basically heat-generated ablation of the vein that you um, achieve by injecting uh, to mesent anesthesia, which means local anesthesia, to relieve the discomfort that is um, generated with those particular devices. RFA ablation is one of them. Laser ablation, EVLT, is another one. A variety of lasers available. And then more recently, uh, we have been using less invasive, less aggressive 
and more rewarding as far as discomfort is concerned, non-thermal, non-thumescent therapies like foam, sclerotherapy, with a variety of what we call detergents that are being used for that. Verthina is one of them, Mocha is another one, and more recently, uh, Venacil, which is anoacrylate uh, that, uh, in my opinion, is probably the most rewarding for a great majority of patients. This does not necessarily mean that the other modalities of treatment are obsolete, uh, not at all, but uh, that certainly is an option. So vein stripping, I don't know how many of you have seen that, and this is maybe a little bit exaggerated, but, uh, <laughs> but uh, it is a certainly aggressive procedure. It's typically done under general anesthesia. There are several incisions made, and uh, it's for robust individuals uh, like Bill Godley uh, here that's standing and observing this particular procedure. So uh, uh, stab phlebectomy for varicosities, uh, is where you use uh, hemostats and uh, hooks and you tease that venous uh, uh, segment out, as you can see. So uh, this is done obviously with tumescent anesthesia. You sometimes make 30 or 40 different stabs with uh, 11 blade to remove those uh, varicosities. And that is occasionally needed and, and useful. It's certainly uh, less un uncomfortable than a vein stripping. And this is done, again, with local anesthesia. But this is sometimes the picture for stab phlebectomy that you have to do. So uh, obviously, this is, this is a gruesome type of a thing if you show this to your patient. Uh, this is what you have to do to remove all the varicosities. So that's why uh, more uh, pleasing, less invasive modalities are becoming more and more popular. And, uh, so minimally invasive alternatives offer you faster recovery. Basically, it's done typically on outpatient basis. If any of the physicians perform this type of procedures under general anesthesia in a hospital environment that is totally obsolete, totally inappropriate, and they are ignoring the cost issues and they're ignoring patients' benefits, and uh, that, that would be embarrassing to do that, but it's still happening in a lot of instances, even in neighboring institutions here, anyhow. So procedural details with uh, RFA and laser procedures. Uh, RFA means radio frequency, and there are several products available. It's an outpatient procedure. You use an ultrasound, ultrasound guided, so you better know or you have to have a good sonographer to guide you through this procedure because it cannot be done without ultrasound guidance. You can resume normal activities immediately. I tell our patients to start walking right away as much as they tolerate the same day. So that is encouraging and rewarding for the patient. I tell them for the ladies to go to Neiman Marcus first and, uh, and they like that. And it's covered by Medicare and CMS, which is very important. So that is an approved procedure. So what laser radio frequency do, they basically shrivel the vein to a string, okay? And that is generated by heat. By denaturating the cells in the intima, and, uh, and basically it's, I tell the patients, like welded vein into a string, okay? Now, uh, so let's talk about benefits, advantages, disadvantages of one versus the other. Vein stripping is a useful procedure. It is uh, successful in a lot of instances, uh, but again, it's aggressive modality. Now, uh, EVLA or uh, radio frequency, when we look at the uh, meta-analysis in 34 randomized controlled trials, is basically uh, equivalent efficacy. That means that they are equally successful, okay? The problem with uh, vein stripping is a blind procedure. So you're basically uh, removing the vein without seeing how much and what segment are you removing. So sometimes there are segments that are not removed and they can eventually cause through collaterals further problems with valuable incompetence and further symptoms. So uh, EVLA and radiofrequency and thermal ablation. So uh, 
when you look at the outcomes with the radio frequency ablation, uh, 92% success rate in occlusion at five years, which is very good. 2.7% uh, of patients have uh, symptoms after that length of follow-up. And as far as laser is concerned, uh, one year occlusion rate is 93%, which is very close to this one. But there is a little bit higher incidence of nerve in now, this is relatively low if it happens to somebody else, but if it happens to you, then it's a significant problem because you could have a permanent paresthesia, even weakness in that extremity if this is very aggressive. And the reason for it is the laser generates more heat. And that is probably the reason. And it also depends how you treat it and where you treat it. Now, meta-analysis between RFA and laser, because there are some uh, proponents of laser, and there are some proponents of uh, radio frequency, but uh, we use both of them and have experience with both of them. I don't think there is a tremendous difference other than post laser, you have a little bit more pain and you have more uh, ecchymosis uh, and a little bit higher incidence of nerve injury, and that's why we use it relatively infrequently. So, over the last several decades, Tumescent uh, thermal ablation therapies have uh, basically replaced uh, uh, surgery for treatment of chronic venous uh, insufficiency. And again, the procedure can be done in a simple, simple setup uh, in your office and uh, on outpatient basis under local anesthesia. Okay. Now, what are the disadvantages of thermal ablation therapies? because all therapies have a certain disadvantages. You heard about elastic stocking disadvantages. Now let's talk about thermal ablation disadvantages. It cannot treat all venous segments due to potential uh, nerve damage. Like you have a femoral nerve that goes very close to uh, the greater saphenous vein. And the further down you go below the knee, the closer they are. So when you generate a temperature of 120 or 140 degrees of centigrade, you will invariably cause some damage to the nerve unless you use a thumescent anesthesia which is called saline uh, mixed with lidocaine bicarbonate and epinephrine and what you're trying to do you're trying to separate or isolate the vein from the nerve but it's almost impossible to do it below the knee so uh, for those of us that are using rfa or laser we will go just below the knee and stop right there. So if the patient has a viral incompetence further down all the way to the ankle, we have to find some other modality to treat this particular problem because we cannot safely treat this with thermal ablation therapy. There is also potential risk of skin burn uh, and stain for superficial veins. So we try to do a variety of things to prevent that, but it's very difficult in those what we call suprafascial veins that are just underneath the skin. And, uh, and that should be avoided. So they all require to mess an anesthesia. And again, and you have to gain experience to know how to do appropriate to mess an anesthesia and to know what is enough and what is not enough as far as to mess an anesthesia. There is a considerable amount of training required to gain proficiency for those type of treatments. And there is a very frequently intra-procedural discomfort, particularly with laser therapy. And there is a post-procedural bruising, primarily because of tumescent anesthesia and many sticks. But also, if you hit the vein inadvertently, you will have a bleeding. So there will be bruising with that. And requires post-procedural compression hose for several weeks. And uh, this is particularly a nuisance in warmer climates like here. And it's very difficult for some patients to to do that, particularly morbidly obese patients that cannot pull up their stockings or frail patients, or patients that have a significant peripheral arterial disease of the lower extremities because you'll compress collaterals and they'll have more symptoms. So this is why the non-tumescent, non-thermal therapies became popular. Uh, and there are a variety of what we call detergents uh, <clears throat> so-called polydocanol is one of them. And then uh, there is a sotradecol that we use more frequently. And then a variety of devices where you have a, 
nitrogen mixed with them or uh, CO2 mixed with them, or if you mix just air with it. Those are a variety of techniques. And more recently, uh, cyanoacrylate adhesive. So cyanoacrylate has been extensively used for uh, aneurysms, brain aneurysms, AV malformations. Some of you have seen me using it for treatment of type 2 endoleaks and so on. So uh, this particular product has been well tested in the past in variety of applications and it has been proven to be uh, safe. And so we obviously have options available as far as this is concerned. So, uh, so non-thumestin, non-thermal therapies uh, have basically evolved to eliminate the risk of thermal ablation. There are less needle sticks, okay, because you don't have to give tumescin. No sedation is required. No tumescin anesthesia. You can treat uh, suprafascial veins, very superficial veins. You can treat the whole saphenous vein, either greater or lesser saphenous vein, without fear to cause nerve damage. And you can significantly lessen procedural and post-procedural discomfort. There will be less bruising. There is no reason for bruising unless uh, you are doing something inappropriate and no risk of bleeding. So for our patients, we actually treat them while they're on anticoagulants. And it is truly a minimally invasive modality of treatment for this particular condition. So Benacil is the only one that's uh, using cyanoacrylate, that is by uh, Medtronic. And uh, as I mentioned, it has been well tested. There is a required technique to learn how to prevent embolization of that material by compressing the vein. And obviously this has to be done under ultrasound guidance. Uh, what are the results when you compare a variety of uh, non-tumescent therapies, uh, polydocanol, uh, uh, sotradecol in variety of forms or shapes, and uh, uh, versus venacil. As you can see, venacil offers you excellent results as far as um, follow-up follow -up occlusion rates, 99% at six months and 94% at 36 months if you do it appropriately, which is uh, lower than with other modalities and pretty comparable, uh, I would say, to radio, radio frequency ablation. Um, but uh, this one obviously can avoid certain things that can occur with radio frequency ablation. Mentioning a little bit about uh, polydocanol and VANISH2 trial results, um, there was in this particular uh, study risk of thrombus extension to safranofemoral junction in about 4% of patients and incidence of uh, proximal DVT in 2.6% or distal DVT in 3%. And 50% uh, of patients were treated with anticoagulants because of the concerns and potential risk. With uh, uh, Venacil, we do not at any point of time for any patients uh, give any anticoagulants. So that is another benefit here. Wanted to share a few patients with you that came uh, to me uh, for treatment of chronic venous insufficiency. This is almost embarrassing to mention that uh, this particular patient was 76 year old vascular surgeon that totally neglected his health and care, uh, diabetes, peripheral arterial disease, hypertension, hyperlipidemia, and chronic renal failure, and non-healing ulcers. We treated this patient, um, uh, we treated this patient with uh, Vena seal from the ankle all the way up. And uh, one week after that, this wound looks dramatically better. It was dry and healing real well. So that was certainly very rewarding. Now, when you would look at this young lady that came to me, you would say she has the most beautiful legs. She could be in a glamour magazine or wherever else. Why would you even consider doing anything for her. There is no varicose veins and so on, but she had all the classical symptoms. So first we established a diagnosis. She was only 27 years old that she had, she developed DVT during pregnancy. Diagnosis of May Turner syndrome was established. Then she had a placement of the iliac stent because of 90% uh, residual stenosis and she was at significant risk of 
occluding that vein again. And uh, she had significant valvular incompetence of uh, the greatest saphenous veins bilaterally, because May Turner can present with your symptoms bilaterally, and uh, uh, no problems with uh, deep venous system. And this is how it looked, this leg looked at the end of the procedure, okay? So just one Band-Aid, no elastic stocking, nothing, and she flew back to Mexico the next day. And this is how it looked, treating both legs. So, venous seal procedure, one stick, local anesthesia, no tumescence, no sedation, no elastic stockings. This is what I like. This is what I call minimalist approach to uh, treatment of any kind of condition. Here's another patient, had a totally incompetent greater saphenous vein from the ankle all the way up. Okay, so you treated the ankle. You would use the radio frequency, you would lose, use laser. You could not do that because you would run the risk of uh, damaging the nerve. A little bit about May Turner syndrome because uh, this is very important. Uh, about 25% of us here in the audience have May Turner syndrome and you don't know about it. Now, 30% of female population has it and about 20% of the male population has it, okay? And why again I'm complaining that the females have more problems with this? Well, because they have a different anatomy as far as pelvis is concerned, the angle of the pelvis and uh, the way the vessels bifurcate and so on. So, uh, so this was described by May and Turner in the angiology in 1957 on pathological specimens. Uh, but Virko in 1800s, a uh, vast surgeon from Germany, from Berlin, was the first one to describe. Everybody knows about the work of triads, but very few know that actually he was the first one to describe the compression of the iliac veins. So it's also called uh, iliocaval compression syndrome or Crockett syndrome that occurs secondary to the compression of the iliac veins by overriding iliac artery. It could be common, could be external, or whatever. And this is how we look angiographically, you see? Anyhow. Now, what's important is who gets it? Well, uh, it is seen in more than 25% of, as I mentioned, healthy individuals, but it can vary tremendously uh, among patients that have a left-sided EVT. So if you see a patient in your office, young patient, that's very pronounced, or middle age or older patient, pronounced veins, varicose veins in the left leg only and nothing on the right side, consider May Turner syndrome. Anyhow, so pay attention to uh, this particular feature. It is easily diagnosed just with an ultrasound, okay? As you can see here, you can see the velocity difference, you can see the compression, you can see the compression here or the compression here. Uh, you have a variety of other modalities with the ultrasound available to establish the diagnosis, reversal of the flow, collateral flow, all of those things can be used. And uh, you have to make sure that you send the patient to the appropriate vascular lab that knows how to evaluate for this condition. MRI and CT angiography is also very useful, as you can see here, you can see here clearly, showing the compression. It's very infrequently used. You have to talk to your radiologist, what are you looking for? And you have to make sure it's MRV, not MRA, because if you order MRA, they will miss the venous phase. So make sure that you inform your radiologist, what are you looking for? So pre and post venous seal, as you can see in this patient, very rewarding for venous ulcers. We can use also um, sclerotherapy for uh, uh, varicose veins or uh, greater saphenous veins that were left untreated after radiofrequency ablation. We can uh, treat uh, telangiectasias with uh, sclerotherapy and uh, spider veins. Uh, but the important thing is address the main problem first. So it means treat the greater saphenous or lesser saphenous vein first. In a lot of instances, the uh, problems with uh, spiders and telangiectasias will disappear or improve 
to a significant degree. But this is not a cosmetic condition. I have seen patients with this type of condition actually still having symptoms of burning sensation, tingling, and numbness. So in a lot of instances, actually, it should be treated, okay? So what can you expect related to endovascular treatment of chronic venous insufficiency? You can expect in the great majority of your patients resolution of their symptoms related to a chronic venous insufficiency. You can dramatically reduce the incidence of complications if you treat this early, prevent DVT, venous ulcerations, unnecessary hospitalization, and also unnecessary antibiotic treatment. You can stop a lot of medication that the patients are taking for a variety of conditions that are actually not causing this problem. And your patients would be much happier if you would uh, give them the optimal treatment for this particular condition. So endovascular treatment of chronic venous insufficiency depends on your knowledge and your experience and common sense, and then you gain excellence. But lack of knowledge and lack of experience can lead to disastrous complications as seen here. And those are my patients that were referred to me too late. So knowledge, ladies and gentlemen, you see only what you look for and you recognize only what you know. Thank you very much for your attention.